This show is about your mental health. While it's supported by the pillars of positivity and hope, if you find yourself in crisis, please reach out for help. In many communities in both the United States and Canada, you can dial 211 to be connected to mental health and crisis services in your region. While it may seem like it at times, you are not alone. Hi, I'm Kevin Frankish. Welcome to The Happy Molecule. Necessity is indeed the mother of invention. And as we weather the worst mental health crisis in generations, the treatment of mental health has taken one of the biggest step forwards ever. Digital online therapy. One of these offerings is Ability CBT, and they are now one of my sponsors. As promised, I'm only going to work with sponsors that I firmly believe in, and that's indeed the case here. But exactly how does digital online therapy work? Nigel Branker from Ability joins me now to begin my digital therapy. Right here, right now, full disclosure. Digital Therapy 101 right now on The Happy Molecule. Hi, Nigel. Welcome back. Hi, Kevin. Thanks for having me on your podcast. It's, uh, it's interesting. We've talked now for quite some time, and, and I think it was, it was pre-online digital therapy. Um, so uh, it, it's really interesting to sort of see how mental health and care has evolved. Yeah, and how it continues to evolve. I mean, it's really evolving at a rapid pace as we not only get more data, but you know, like everything else coming out of COVID-19, we're just seeing people's comfort level with digital and online changing. We're seeing the demand for our services increase as more of us struggle with their mental health. Um, so it, it has been uh, quite the evolution since you and I first started to talk and it continues to be quite the evolution. All right, so we are going to do Online Digital Therapy 101. We're going to start from the very beginning, walk people through what it is. We're going to talk about costs. We're going to be upfront with, with, with costs and that because that's not pretty well the number one question I get asked from people. And, you know, we're going to go through a bit of my own digital online therapy because I am today joining up with Ability CBT and I'm going to tell people sort of what it's like. Now, I'm fortunate enough to live in Ontario. And if you're fortunate enough to live in Ontario and Manitoba, this is covered by the government. Correct. Yeah, we're really thrilled with our partnerships with both the government of Ontario and the government of Manitoba. And, uh, you know, they were both very progressive in recognizing the impact of COVID-19 on our mental health, on isolation, on, on dealing with new issues and having to work from home and being separate from our loved ones. And, you know, that without having the right support and care, you know, that, that takes its toll. I mean, we're into 15 months now. And so, yeah, we, we were, we're thrilled with our partnership with both those governments to make it available free to all Ontarians and all Manitobans. And let me put a little message in here to the other uh, governments, uh, both provincial and territorial in this country, um, that maybe they might want to consider the same thing as Ontario and Manitoba. Because when we talk about mental health and we talk about treating mental health, we actually talk about saving money elsewhere in our health budgets, because we know that, that mental health issues can lead to heart disease, can lead to uh, alcoholism, can lead to a whole, a whole raft of health issues that we're already paying for. Yeah, cor cor correct. And, and, and I think also, uh, you know, I'd also talk a little bit about the impact of COVID-19, right? If I look at, I mean, we, we started to track three years ago, a mental health index, which looks at the mental health and well-being of Canadians. And, uh, you know, I won't bore you with all the statistics from it, but the one statistic that I think a lot about is if I look at the portion of the population that, you know, would benefit for something like, uh, like online digital therapy, if you ask me pre-pandemic, it might have been about 8% of the population that was struggling with moderate anxiety or moderate depression or greater. And in the last 15 months, that's more than doubled. It's at about 16 or 17% of the population. So one in six Canadians. In that same period, to your point, Kevin, we haven't doubled the supply or the availability of support. <laughs> so twice as many people could benefit from support. And there isn't twice as much support out there, which is why we think, you know, online therapy that's clinically effective has a role to play in the long term, in the long term health system. And digital online therapy is 
therapy. This isn't some, you know, just some small measure that you can do until you can actually see a therapist in person. This will have lasting impacts on your mental health, especially the fact that we're, we're dealing with CBT or cognitive behavior therapy. Yeah, correct. And maybe I can unpack that a little bit, Kevin, um, uh, because you're right. I think this is, this is actual therapy. And if we think about uh, the definition of therapy, it sometimes still has stigma, but, but therapy is really just a way of helping you to remediate uh, a clinical or medical issue. So it's the same way that if you, you pulled a muscle, you would go to physiotherapy. <laughs> um, you don't have to go to physiotherapy, but going to physiotherapy because of the science that's applied, you're more likely for your muscle to heal properly and you're less likely to have repeat injuries. And, and it's very much the same with psychotherapy, right? We think that uh, as we're all struggling, these are not things that we're naturally thought of, taught of how to deal with anxiety, or how to deal with depression, or how to recognize our symptoms or how to recognize when we're spiraling and what are the tools to help us you know, build up. So this is real therapy and, uh, and it's delivered digitally as compared to, and you still get some of the benefits of traditional talk therapy, but to your point, we think uh, digital therapy is evolving and uh, you know, it should be plan A, not plan B. All right, so I have pulled up the website. Um, I also on another screen have my uh, profile, which we're gonna be opening up in a little bit. And, and the first thing that I see is something, and I have to admit, uh, Nigel, I, I've stolen this line uh, for a few times. You deserve to feel better. It's right at the top. It's in big, bold letters. And a lot of people, like, you know, they have trouble with that. And, and they don't realize how important they are and how important it is that they feel better, that, that they shouldn't be left aside. I love that opening line. Yeah, th thanks. And, and we, when we thought about that, Kevin, we were, it was really a call out to, as you alluded to, cognitive behavioral therapy and what's at the heart of CBT. And basically at the heart of CBT is a recognition that how we think, how we feel and how we behave is all interreactive. <laughs> and, and so, you know, often the feelings are the lagging indicator. I feel sad, I feel overwhelmed, but it also leads into, I can't sleep, I'm up all night, I feel anxious. Um, and, you know, again, a lot, uh, for a lot of us, you know, we've either dealt with this our whole life or we haven't aware that, that we haven't been aware that care is available or we haven't known where to go. It hasn't been accessible. So these are some of the, you know, these are some of the barriers that we're trying to overcome. But at, at its basics, yeah, we all deserve to be our best possible selves for our friends, for our families, for ourselves. And, and there's science behind that. And there's ways and there's steps you can take to, to feel better. So the address is myicbt.com. So that's my and then ICBT, which stands for Internet Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, just so we can establish. So it's ability, uh, sorry, it's uh, myicbt.com. Uh, Nigel, what, what about people, uh, and, and I talk about this a lot, and that is, you know, don't wait to, to, to live with depression or anxiety. If, I mean, if you feel that you are fully functioning, your, 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 your mental health is fine, I've always encouraged people to actually seek counsel anyway, just as a maintenance, you know, sort of like taking your car in to change the oil. Nothing wrong with your, your car, but you bring your, you bring your car in, you change that oil, uh, you'll keep it running forever and ever and ever. So no use, especially the younger you are, you know, why, why not go and speak to someone and say, listen, how do I make sure that as I get older, because that's when it's going to hit you when you get older. So you, you'll take people like that. Oh, for sure. And I think, you know, what's, what's special about our program is it's a hybrid. Um, there's a digital part of it, which means there are things you can do on your own, on your own time, on a consumer grade platform. You can track your progress, et cetera. But there's also um, access, as much access as you need to a fully qualified therapist and that you can interact with that therapist as much or as little as you'd like. So if I think about something like anxiety, um, what you're talking about is, you know, if you go through the screening that we'll go through and there's a, 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 a score on your anxiety score and it could be lower, it could be medium, it could be high. And what we found is, to your point, even people who score low, what will happen is that they're more likely to go through 
the exercises go through the structure on their own with less involvement from a therapist, but they still benefit from all the value. And people that are maybe screening a little higher than mild or moderate or higher may take more advantage of the access to the therapist. But to your point, the program is there for everyone and helps everyone. And that's the, to me, the beauty of it being a hybrid is it allows someone to work with their assigned therapist as much or as little as they'd like. Who's behind all this? Uh, who is looking at this? Uh, you know, I'm used to being on the internet and dealing with a lot of bots. And you know what? Sometimes that's fine. Um, I was doing something with my website the other day and there were some questions I had. And so I dealt with a bot and I knew it was a bot and it, it said it was. Uh, and, and for that, it answered my questions. It got me through, but also gave me the, you know, the, the, the choice to talk to a real human being. But when we come to this, what kind of team is behind Ability CBT? Yeah, great, great question. So it's a very human team. Um, we we have uh, as the largest well-being provider in Canada. We have an established network of therapists, and really, what we're seeing and uh, what we try to accomplish is how do we help our highly qualified therapists to access and help as many people as possible. So in our case, we're really using technology not to replace the therapist, but to make the treatment more effective and to allow you to do things on your own. If you think if you've ever done a traditional therapy, and I'm not against traditional therapy, it's it still works for a lot of people. But for most of us, if I've met with a therapist for an hour, in that hour, there are things where the therapist may ask me to make a list or complete a workbook. And we just thought there's really no, there's not a lot of value. Firstly, you may not want to be doing that at that point in time. Secondly, there's not a lot of value in the therapist watching you complete the workbook. So what we try to do is deconstruct the things that you can do on a platform at your own pace and your own time, um, but with still access to a therapist to see those results, to meet with you, to discuss them. So it is very much, um, I wouldn't even say back. I mean, the therapists are at the heart of our program, but what we've tried to do with online and digital is really use technology in a clever way to not sacrifice anything in terms of being clinically effective, but to make it more accessible to people to do work and to do to access therapy on their own time, on mm -hmm. their own conditions. And, and you know what, and this is not a diss towards mental health professionals at all, but when it comes to any sort of therapy, in-person therapy, whatever, um, you do 90% of the work and 90% of the talking. And the therapist, that that's what they're trained for. They're trained to be your guide. They're more, they're more like a guide. What do you think about this? Okay, well, well how, how does this make you feel? They ask mainly short questions and you do all the talking. So I think that this can be extremely effective as well uh, when you're an active participant. All right. For sure. And maybe Kevin, Mr. to yeah. rejoin on that point, I'd say, uh, you know, you talked about mental, mental health therapy. It's the same with any type of therapy, if you're going through rehab therapy. I mean, I remember, you know, if I pulled my hamstring playing sports, um, you know, when I was younger, I would go to my physiotherapist and my phys physiotherapist would give me homework and I would sort of they'd say, hey, did you do your homework? Did you do the annoying exercise with the towel? And initially I'd say no, but then I realized that I'm not, or, or I'd say yes, if I haven't. But to your point, um, it's, there's no advantage to, to lying to my therapist, right? It's like, I have to put the work in to help that muscle improve. My therapist, it's my muscle. The therapist is there to help me and to tell me what I need to do and to encourage me and to tell me if I'm doing it correctly to build up that muscle. And I think it's very much the same with mental health. All right. And folks, the nice thing about this too is that you can go online. No one has to know. And you can, even if you're not fully decided you're going to do it, you can at least go through some of the processes off the top and and see what it's like, which is what we hope to do a little bit uh, with, with this episode is, is sort of just give you a bit of a flavor that it's not that difficult. It's very user friendly and um, it's something that can be of huge benefit to you. So if you've been putting off getting mental health help, this is a great place to at least uh, let, let's dip our toes into the water. I, I agree, Kevin. Okay, so I'm just calling out. Okay, so we're going to go through a bit of my health screening questions. I um, now, I've I already and and this is something too that that even if you've been in therapy before, like I have, um, there's nothing wrong with this. This is is a great addition. So I have been uh, diagnosed in the past with severe depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder. So um, 
let's see. Okay, so I'm pushing it says, let's get started. Uh, there's the waiver and consent form. I have read the entire thing and I have said yes. Uh, okay, so it's saying in the past a month for at least two weeks, have you experienced any of the following? Depressed mood or sad, hopeless or loss of interest or pleasure? Now, I'm going to say at this point, no, uh, but I haven't, I have in the past, but not in the last two weeks. Have you ever tried to kill yourself? Now this, it, it, like bang, that hits you, right? But suicide is something we don't talk enough about and bring it out into the open. And we're always afraid just simply to say, have you ever tried to kill yourself? And that, you know, that is a question that is important to ask people and no one's going to judge you. This is, this is the other thing too, is, is, is this is not a judgmental question. Nobody's going to wag a finger and say shame on you. And we're sending the police over to your house right now. It's, it's all part of, of what your thought process is. How, how important is self-harm in this, in this therapy and treating self-harm? Well, it's, it's incredibly important, and I'll, I'll, I'll answer with you know a couple of statistics. Firstly, I wanted to comment as you were going through for your listeners, as you were going through the questionnaire. The questionnaire is dynamic, which means the flow of questions that you would experience are different than the flow mm -hmm. of questions I would experience. So if you, if you know, if you say in your case you said you haven't felt depressed or anxious in the last two weeks, if I said I had, then it would take me down a different path. But in all cases, we try to make it very personalized. You get through it in, um, you know, in five minutes or something. Um, back to your point about crisis and you know, being at risk of harming yourself or harming others is a symptom of um, you know of not being able to cope and not not, been got, not having gotten the help that uh, that's available so we put it right up front and you know we're an established organization we're not a startup so we are right away we'll get you connect you with crisis support you know when we've done online on our social media platform at ability cares we've come across people on social media who said it's too late for me to try this program and we've mm -hmm. reached out to try to support them so you know, I couldn't agree with you more, Kevin. There's no, and and I, you know, and anyone who works in the mental health field, and I, I, I didn't um, professionally. I didn't grow up in this field. I learned more about this field as I took it on later in my career. And, and you learn things like, you know, I, I will never say someone commits suicide. You know, it's not a crime. Someone can die by suicide because <laughs> they yeah. haven't gotten the help that they needed. And so. You know, I think in our program, what we've seen is, especially when we offer, you know, in the workplace, in the workplace, you know, we have an EAP, we might see two or 3% of the population screening in crisis, but most of the people that screen, that are in the workplace are, you know, not in crisis, they're highly functioning. When we offered it more above, broadly to the population, when we saw something like 20% of the population screen in crisis, that doesn't mean all 20% have suicidal tendencies, but it means that um, there was some risk there, some heightened risk of harming themselves or others. And, um, you know, we wanted to get them and we wanted to make sure our program gets them care as, uh, as soon as we could. So I, I couldn't agree with you more. And you get the big, you're getting the biggies out of the way with first, I don't want to say out of the way with, but you're bringing the biggies right to the forefront. Have you experienced, witnessed, or been threatened with a physical or sexual assault or been exposed to traumatic events such as death, serious injury, major disaster, or serious violence? So now we're, now we're starting to get into a bit of the PTSD uh, as well in here. Yeah, correct. And and I mean, in terms of our program, we talk a lot about clinical effectiveness and you've talked about anxiety and depression, but part of the, the screening is to, we don't expect um, a client or a user to be able to clinically diagnose themselves. We don't expect them to say, I'm suffering from anxiety versus depression versus um, alcohol addiction versus PTSD. So some of these questions are really being asked to help the therapist when you're assigned a therapist to get to know you a little better and to get you on a program that's well suited for what you're experiencing. So that's part of why we're getting these questions out of the way as well. And to, to, mm. to help shape that next interaction, when you complete this, you're assigned a therapist, you have a, a live session with a therapist, and now they've had time to review these questions and can start to help you in the way that's most meaningful for you. And there's a, a, a sort of a page counter at the top. Uh, it says, I, I'm at three out of eight. Uh, out of this. So you're, you're following along, you know, how much more you have to do. Uh, the next question is, and, and we talked about, we just, you just mentioned alcohol. Do you drink alcohol? There's also a standard drink guide here. This gets to be, especially in this time, because we've seen alcohol use increase significantly over the last 15 months. 
And it gets into the, that, that kind of debate with yourself. Do I drink? Do I drink too much? Well, you know, the thing is, is that this is between you and the therapist that, that will work with you. And it's so important to be honest with yourself to begin with. Don't try and don't try and qualify or, or, or justify what, what you're drinking. So I'm going to put a yes. How often do you, do you have a drink containing alcohol? Now, um, I'm going to say four or more times a week. It, it, that's, the, as, it, that's as high as it goes. I, I have, I think, too much wine sometimes. Uh, so that, the best answer that describes your use of alcohol bever- alcoholic beverages this past year. So we're talking about lockdown. How has it changed? Uh, how many drinks do you have containing alcohol on a typical day when you're drinking? One to two, three to four, three, and it gives you a number, a number of answers. Um, so how many drinks containing alcohol do you have on a typical day when you are drinking? You know what? I'm going to go on a, on a typical day. One to two, three to four. It, it sort of varies for me. I'll go on the higher end, three to four. How often do you uh, have? So now it, it's really it's it's zeroing in on on the alcohol. So I'm still at a three out of eight. So I've I've answered some questions, and as you said, it goes through uh, you know and asks me more questions about that. How often do you have six or more drinks on one occasion? Uh, I'm going to say less than monthly. Uh, how often during the last year have you found that you were not able to stop drinking once you have started? And I'm. I'm glad to say never. Uh, how often during the last year have you failed to do what was normally expected to be because of drinking? Never, thank, thank goodness. And, but there's no shame, by the way, in giving the answer. There's no shame. It is who you are. And obviously, because you're on this site, you would like to have some help with that. And, and the therapist can't help you if you're, gonna, if you're going to say, no, it doesn't interfere with my life when it does. Yeah, I agree, Kevin. A lot of this, and we're we're talking about the alcohol questions, but in general, you know, what we've seen through the last 50 months through COVID-19 is as people have um, been impacted by their uh, their mental health and well-being has been impacted in the absence of recognizing that's happening and getting support, there are many ways that we can cope that are not good. And that's why we sort of see an increase in alcohol consumption or recreational drugs. That's why we see an increase in suicidal ideation. We see an increase in domestic violence. So back to your point, um, having two or three, two drinks a day, let's say, is for you to talk to your therapist about, I, I can't absolutely say that um, two is a good number or a bad number, right? I mean, it might be that you had zero before the pandemic and you're up to two. It might be that you always had two. What we're trying to do is help you baseline. Have you, are you, do you think that you're moving further and further away from your best self and that there's then that you could benefit from some help? That's really all we're trying to baseline and, and help you with and sort of inform when you connect with the therapist. Okay, now, now we're getting into something here. Uh, now I'm moving on to number four of eight. Uh, do you use recreational drugs such as marijuana, cocaine, or heroin, or have you or anyone close to you been concerned about your use of prescription drugs such as painkillers or sedatives? Uh, I'm going to be perfectly open here. I, I smoke marijuana recreationally. So I'm going to put, uh, it says, do you use recreational drugs? So yes. Have you found you use drugs much more than you intended to? Uh, I'm going to say no, but, but again, this last year has been unprecedented. And yeah. people have been seeking self-medication. They have been seeking solace. They have been seeking an escape. And so, yeah, sometimes it can really take do the uh, take uh, take over you. Um, have you ever wanted to uh, cut down on the use? I'm gonna put. I'm gonna put no. I I don't. Have you spent a lot of time using or recovering from the effects of drugs? No. Uh, have you had a craving, a strong desire, or urge to use drugs? Uh, fortunately, no. Has your work, family, or social life suffered because you were intoxicated, high, or recovering from drug use? And I'm going to put no. Uh, and has your drug use caused problems with other people, such as family members, friends, or coworkers? No. Uh, have you had to give up or spend less time at work with family or friends on things you like to do because you were intoxicated? No. Have you been intoxicated or high before doing something that requires coordination or concentration? No. And did you continue uh, drugs use even though it caused or worsened physical or psychological problems? 
This is an interesting question and it's something that I don't want people just to rush through. So did you continue drugs use, even though it caused or worsened physical or psychological problems? You've got to sort of like right away, this is, this is CBT folks. This, this is all of a sudden making you think. So yes, I've used it, but has it worsened my problems, whether they're physical or psychological? And I think that that's a really interesting and telling question because it's making you responsible to yourself. And that's who you're responsible for, right? Is to yourself. Yeah, correct. And as I've said, with any form of therapy, a therapist uh, is, is there to help you, right? Like, and then to, to help empower you. So this really starts the journey. All right. So now we've moved on to five. So we've, we've moved, so it looks like we're, these are sections. So they see so the eight that I'm going to be answering are in sections. So I'm in section five of eight. Um, have you ever experienced four consecutive days in which you have felt so good, high, or on top of the world, or irritable that other people thought that you were not your normal self? This is, this is something that is becoming more prevalent, especially with young people. And, and how, how, how young can people take this therapy, Nigel? Now in Canada, over the age of 16 over the age of 16. And we have seen our 16, 17. I mean, we've seen our teens and young adults um, experience I don't want to say increase bipolar symptoms of bipolar. We just diagnose it better. And so I can tell right away that this question is really sort of leaning, okay, let's talk about your highs and your lows when it comes to your emotion. And when you have extreme highs and extreme lows, then we start to wonder about bipolar. I talked to one expert uh, here, he's a bipolar researcher, who is saying that out of all the teens he sees, who are complaining about some sort of depression or mental health issue, 44% have been diagnosed with bipolar. And so, you know, especially when it comes to our younger, our younger generations, uh, we don't get them into mental health therapy as much as, as we should. Well, and, and, and the other point I would touch on, Kevin, as you're going through the questionnaire is, you know, a lot of what we talk about, our tagline is you deserve to feel better. Our program, Ability CBT, um, covers a lot of presenting issues and can work for a lot of people. It's not for every presenting issue and it's not for everyone. When I look at our partnerships with Ont the governments of Ontario and Manitoba, um, part of what we're really proud of is being part of almost an ecosystem where you can step up or step down care. So completing this questionnaire through our program, our program would not be appropriate for bipolar, but we would be able to work with partners mm -hmm. within the province of Ontario to connect you with the right support. And that's why, you know, a lot of this is just to take the first step, even if it turns out our program is, you know, maybe not the right program for you, it's good to know, and let's start the process to get you the right support. You're not gonna be left high and dry. It's like, Correct. we can't help you, thank you very much, have a nice day. You're not gonna be left high and dry. All right, I'm on to section seven of eight. In the last month, have you ever had an intense rush of anxiety, sudden attacks of panic, or suddenly felt very frightened or anxious to the extent that you avoided certain situations that might cause further attacks? So we're talking about anxiety attacks and panic attacks, something that is all too common. Uh, in fact, a lot of people sometimes don't even recognize them as such. Fortunately, um, I have done a lot of work over the years and I, I've been able to, to stave them off. However, this I'm talking to more and more people and people are contacting me saying, yeah, I am. I've never had anxiety attacks before. Uh, so definitely something. And, and, and this can be helped. This can be helped. This can be treated. This is not, it's hopeless for me. I have these mental health issues. I'll live with them for the rest of my life. There is treatment and there is help available for, for really for every single kind of mental health issue. Yeah, that's a, and this is a great example, Kevin, of what our program will do. If I look at our anxiety program, it's arming you with the tools. So by the time you get to an anxiety attack, a series of triggers have happened and have led you to this. So you need to deal with the attack. But also there's sort of the basics of self-care. Like, have you been sleeping? Have you been taking care of yourself? Have you been, uh, do you know how to breathe pro properly? Do you have the tools to recognize when this is happening? How to remove yourself from the situation? So it's really arming you with tools. <laughs> To be able to to better deal and i think i you know it's timely i've talked to you when we first started talking about this one example i used and it's timely because we're in the middle of the the euros for those soccer fans out there but if you ever look at a a soccer player about to take a penalty kick you know they 
you can see them focusing on their breathing, right? Because at that moment, they're trained professionals, but this is something that can cause anxiety at this point. There's 50,000 people watching buildings around the world. So even something as simple as that, you see someone practicing the breathing technique to say, bring my heart rate down, focus my thoughts. Uh, mental health in sports is a fascinating study if you look at kickers in the NFL, and we can go on and on and on. But my only point of that is to say, to your point, there is there are tools that we're not always taught. And unless you've actually gone down, the, you've been exposed to someone that can help you you, you, you think something's wrong with you. Why am I feeling anxious? But there's a lot of things that we can do to help you. And this is really about making that sort of support accessible. I love that comparison. I, I'm thinking of a baseball pitcher sitting on the, or standing on the mound. And, and I think that, that we would know something isn't going to go right if that that, that kicker or the pitcher just turned around through the ball, kicked the ball immediately without even thinking, without going, we, we would say, you're not trying. And so that is a great analogy. They're, they're focusing, they're, they're, they've got their eye on the prize, so to speak, and they're going to make an attempt. Now, they may not score, but maybe they will. Maybe they will the, the next time. That they're giving is, themselves I, I every that. chance. Yeah. Um, do you feel extremely self-conscious, anxious, or afraid in social settings, such as meeting people for the first time, public speaking, or ordering food in a restaurant? Now, for me, meeting people is still, still causes anxiety. I, I feel, you know, I'm not good enough very often. I have no problem public speaking, in the, but in the back of my mind, I, I'm extremely worried about, are people going to like me? I'm always worried, you know, honestly, I'm always worried that people are going to discover I'm a phony. Do you know what I mean? And, and so <laughs> I'm treating you like a doctor right now, Nigel. I apologize. No, no need to apologize at all. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think, and I, and I know I've heard from other people as well, that they feel a certain way, but they want people to like them, but they're worried people are not because they're going to discover something hidden about them. So I'm going to put a yes on on that are you bothered by repetitive oh, oh, kevin and... sorry yeah go ahead. That, no it's okay quick comment yeah. on that previous point yeah. i'll just get back to the you know kind of the point the, the way we've designed the program is to get people the right level of care so you talked about in your case you know maybe you've been diagnosed with generalized anxiety um, mm -hmm. anxiety itself is a presenting issue there are many different uh forms and so part of what this question does is you know we have a program embedded in an ability cbt for social anxiety, you might you might find that your anxiety is only triggered in social settings, mm -hmm. in which case the way the therapist, the, the tools the therapist will arm you with are a little different than the tools. And if you were suffering from generalized anxiety, and again, we are trying to take the pressure off the person. It's not for you to diagnose yourself to say, I have generalized anxiety versus social anxiety. That's not for you to know. But through answering these simple questions, we can then connect you with the right the right program, the right therapist, the right support to help you getting back to being your best possible self. And if, um, you know, we, we've talked about social anxiety before on, on, on this program, um, we are headed towards the lifting of lockdown. And ex many mental health experts are extremely fearful right now for their patients and the population at large that we're going to be very surprised all of a sudden we are going to experience social anxiety because we've wanted lockdown to lift for the last 15 months. This is the goal and we can't wait. We're so excited. I hope this never happens again. However, we are going to be presented with situations where we're going to get on a bus with a crowd. We're going to go to a theater for the first time. We're going to be getting back to a routine, you know, for me, getting up, not having to worry about what my hair looks like or anything like that, or worry about commuting. And a lot of people have, but now we're going to get back into a routine of things that maybe we didn't like so much before. So all this could possibly lead to social anxiety. So this is a chance to be proactive as opposed to, to, to reactive. So let's be prepared for the lifting of lockdown by, by getting some therapy and, and really preparing ourselves. Well, Kevin, to your point, it might be things that we can work on. Also, the self-awareness, right? Like having and being able to talk through. I mean, I saw a study uh, actually in the U.S. in the Washington Post that said the majority of people of color or marginalized groups are not looking forward to going back to the workplace because one of the advantages of working remotely in many cases is there are less microaggressions. Um, and so 
most of us are, you know, many of us are looking forward to go back to the workplace, but a lot of us are not. And so I think to your point, a program like this with therapy is or having the chance to connect with someone to just talk it through, like what, what is it that you're, that's not feeling right about heading back to the workplace, heading, being on a bus, being on an airplane. Um, you know, we have a, we have a program around pandemic anxiety. So again, it's not for the client or the user to be able to diagnose that, but I think just the act of going through a structured process, talking to a therapist, understanding more about your symptoms, and then let's put together a program on a digital platform to help you, um, I think will go a long way. And I think you're absolutely right. I think as we approach uh, return to office, um, I think we have a workforce that's uh, our population that's, uh, you know, kind of on the one case is look, looking forward to it, on the other hand, kind of running on fumes and there's, you know, there's new fears to, to this new reality. Uh, and we could we can also add into there uh, uh, people from uh, from First Nations communities and and indigenous gotcha. communities, especially right now. So they're dealing with the anxiety of returning back into the workplace, but they're also dealing with all that is going on with residential schools and 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 how to deal with that. So again, you know, reaching out and and really, and again, this program fits so wonderfully in. With, uh, with many beliefs of First Nations because it talks about yourself. It talks about you, the, the healing coming from within and not from a pill. So it, it, it's definitely something uh, to be considered. Okay, are you bothered by repetitive and unwanted thoughts that have to do with things such as cont uh, contamination, fears, violent urges, or being, thoughts of being, uh, things being out of place? Um, not so much. I'm seeing it, and, and I'm, I'm, you know, just it's just in 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 research and that that I've done before. So I'm seeing a little bit of of thoughts about OCD here. Uh, that so it's really covering the gamut of different mental health issues. Agreed. And again, back to our earlier point of like, yeah, this is meant to be a one stop shop to say, you know, click on the link answer the questions, and then we can help you figure out what's right. Is it our program? Is it something else? Which aspect of our program? Uh, we're really trying to de debunk and, and destigmatize and demystify mental health support. And this is again, where you need to be honest with yourself, or maybe you're going to see something in yourself you didn't realize, wait a minute. Yeah. Okay. That's contributing to, to me not feeling as comfortable in life. Are there certain rituals or repetitive behaviors that you must do in order to avoid anxiety or stress, such as hand washing, checking, or mental acts, such as counting or repeating words silently. So um, I'm, going to, I'm going to put a no on that, but, but there are people who are going to say, oh, you know what? Yes. I never really thought about that, but yes. Do you have a long-standing history of difficulty focusing, easily distracted, organizing, or finishing tasks? Yes, yes, a thousand times yes um, for me. I'm going to repeat that question again for people. Do you have a long-standing history of difficulty focusing? Oh, my gosh. I walk into a room, and I can't remember why I walked in there. Easily distracted, so very easily distracted. Organizing, I'm the worst, and finishing tasks, very difficult. All right, I, that's a yes on that. Do you have a long-standing history of being fidgety, restless, talk too much, complete people's sentences, or have difficulty waiting your turn? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, do you have uh, persistent difficulties with sleep? For example, do you wake up frequently at night or don't feel well rested when you wake up? I'm going to put no. I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate uh, with that. All right. I am now on section eight of eight because of my mental health, my ability to work is impaired. And it gives you, um, it, 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 in this case, it gives you multiple choices to go from zero, not at all, to eight severely. Because of my mental health, my ability to work is impaired. Let me think for a moment. Do you know what? I have a hard time. I'm going to put right down the middle, I'm going to put a four. Yeah, I'm going to put a four on that. Sometimes it's tough for me to sit down and, and, motivate myself to work because of my mental health my home management um is impaired i'm gonna put a three on that yeah uh because of my mental health and this is out of eight th those scores by the way are, yep. are out of eight because of my mental health my le social leisure activities with other people um are impaired um uh, I, I you know nigel <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna admit i don't have a big social life anyway um no i'm gonna say not at all for that because of my mental health, my private uh, leisure activities um, are impaired. So gardening, collecting, sewing, walking alone. Uh, because of my mental health, my private leisure activities are impaired. Um, I would say maybe a slightly. 
because my mental health, my ability to form and maintain close relationships with others, including those I live with, is impaired. Oh, I, I'm all right there. All right, health screening, done. All right, so it has, it, there's a, a, a button here. It says submit screening. Here we go, submitting it. Uh, your results have been attached to your file for your dedicated therapist to review. Okay, so now, and, I, and, and in a further program, I'm going to reveal the results. Okay, I, I, I'd, I'd like people to know where what happened with that. So, so tune in, hopefully, at the next episode. But now, that, where, where did that go? It's gone. It's gone to our, sorry, to our clinical team, our clinical coordinator team. You'll get a link to look at, um, to book online appointments. So, hey, next Wednesday at 4 p.m. Or that you'll mm -hmm. get a bunch of available appointments to, um, to then book your, your, your session, your, your first meeting with the therapist. And it's really that first meeting plus the assessment that gets you on a program that's appropriate for you. So we do some things from the questionnaire. And then the, based on that questionnaire, you'll have a short uh, meeting or discussion or interview with the, your assigned therapist. And then we'll start the start to open up the modules for you to start and the modules are then tailored to depending on I know what what, what screened out of this when you're doing your questions one one thing that made me smile on the anxiety front and I suffer from anxiety is um, you know we're asking questions based on sort of a clinically efficacious survey that's generally accepted but I would love to you know most people don't know the difference between anxiety and depression I'd love to be able to over time ask users even uh, more, uh, more clients even uh, more more basic questions so I know as someone who suffers from anxiety, one of the telltale clues is I tend to rewatch movies. So people with anxiety struggle with feeling that sense of control. Now, not you know, when things become too overwhelming. And so you subconsciously look for ways to find control. And one easy way is to watch a movie. Because you know, you the, know the outcome. hundred percent. Ah, wow. Okay. Did not know that. Um, Okay, Nigel, I want you to do me a favor. Um, I know we're talking. I know I'm talking to the guy in charge. I really want my experience to be completely, I don't want you to give me any preferential treatment. Not that you would, but I just want to get that clear out right now. I want this to go through normal channels. I, I don't want to be treated any differently than anyone else just because I'm talking to you. Yeah, no, I, I understand. It's important for your listeners to 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 experience the program through your eyes. So we totally get it. I think when you're ready to talk about your, you know, sort of the next steps, I'd love in a future podcast to bring our clinical director on so she can maybe address some of the uh, clinical experiences. But uh, mm -hmm. but no, hundred percent. And we really we we're we're thankful for for you doing this and for helping us to. Um, you know, debunk mental health therapy, digital therapy, and to make it as accessible to as many Canadians as possible. You also gave me an idea for a, a future show, and we're going to do this very soon. What is anxiety? What is depression? Is a panic attack the same as an anxiety attack? Uh, what chemical processes are happening within your body? And there are, there are biological processes yep. when, when this happens. What's the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychotherapist and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I, that, that'd be a great show. So if people want to, and, and I am going to keep you posted in the episodes to come about the reaction I get, my score, uh, and, and as long as the therapist is willing, I may record some, a portion of, of some of the sessions and, and really let you know what it's like. I, I'm going to try and be as open as possible, but please understand there may be some private things that I, I definitely uh, will, will keep to myself. But for the most part, I'm going to be, I'm going to be as open as possible. You can go to my ICBT. So those are the letters ICBT for internet cognitive behavior therapy, my ICBT.com. Or you can just go to Shoppers Drug Mart, right? Tell, tell me about the, the partnership with Shoppers Drug Mart. And, and I mean, that's pretty impressive if Shoppers Drug Mart has chosen Ability CBT. Yeah, we're really proud of that partnership. Um, Shoppers Drug Mart underwent uh, an intensive search process and uh, with their clinical teams, and we were happy to be selected to be their hero partner. So, um, I mean, again, the program is free in Ontario and Manitoba. And then what we've done with Shoppers Drug Mart is if it's uh, in the non-free jurisdictions, if you have health plan coverage, um, et cetera, we'll, uh, you'll get sort of a discounted rate being referred, uh, either accessing it through the PC Health app or being referred from via pharmacists. Okay, so the PC Health app, I'm just going to Shoppers Drug Mart, uh, shoppersdrugmart.ca. And... And just, uh, okay, so all you have to do is, all right, there's a search bar at the very top right-hand corner, type in mental health. 
that's all you got to do in the search bar in Shoppers Drug Mart. I mean, there's there's probably a whole bunch of different addresses I can give you in that, but for the to be easy, yeah, that's probably Drug the Mart. easiest way. As, as, as their preferred mental health partner, it's the yep. easiest way to bubble up to the top for sure. And it's it's right there. Uh, okay, so we are going to talk again. Uh, this is going to be sort of an ongoing process. Um, hey, I have an idea. How about therapy by podcast, Nigel? Maybe that could be next. <laughs> I'm certain we're certainly pretty innovative and open to exploring. So let's see how this this series goes, and then we can uh, we can learn from it. All right. Thank you very much for this. My pleasure, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Well, you may not even realize it, but just the process of answering these questions begins your therapy. Once again, if you live in Ontario and Manitoba, the cost is covered. Elsewhere, there's a good chance your group health insurance covers it. Or you can visit shoppersdrugmart.myicbt.com and that may allow you some discounts. I love their slogan. You deserve to feel better. Because you really do. I'm Kevin Frankish. Thanks for listening. Take care of yourself. And take care of each other. Please consider subscribing to this podcast and also check out the Happy Molecule Extra at thehappymolecule.com. There you'll find a link to a video version of this episode. Be able to join the conversation about mental health, learn about our Facebook Live show, and get a preview of upcoming episodes. You can email us at thehappymolecule at gmail.com. I'm Erin Davis, wishing you good mental health.